All right, so to understand Nelson Mandela, you have to understand some history of South Africa. And in order to understand history of South Africa, you have to understand some geography. So it start, I'm going to come back to this map a couple of times. It starts with Cape Town, which a lot of people think is on the southern tip of South Africa, but it's not. It's uh, a, a wonderful harbor, and the Dutch in 1650 uh, settled Cape Town as really a port for the uh, Dutch Indian Company to help with ships that were going back and forth between the Netherlands and India. Um, the, you're, they were the first Europeans in South Africa, but obviously before them were indigenous people, tribes of all kinds of different tribes. And this map shows some of those different tribes. Where There's another map that's going to show even better. But this is Zululand. This is where Mandela's Thembu tribe, uh, the Thembu tribe who spoke Hosa, is right here. Uh, the Hottentots were in here. And they really were never united peoples. If you had asked members of these Zulu tribes, they would have said they were Zulu. They would not have said they were South African. And that's part of the reason of how the Europeans were able to conquer uh, what is now South Africa was because the tribes were not united. So let's, uh, we're going to come back to this map. By the way, uh, this is, I'll come back to this later, but this is where the first diamond mine was found, the Eureka Diamond right here. And this is Pretoria. Johannesburg is right here. So a lot of the riots were right here. We'll come back to this map. All right, so I said Mandela was a member of the Thembu tribe, um, uh, the Dutch Indian Company, which founded Cape Town. The Dutch were soon followed by French Huguenots, which were the French Protestants fleeing Catholic France. Uh, a number of Germans quickly followed. There was intermarriage between these European groups forming what today are called Afrikaners. Now this gets confusing because an Afrikaner is different from an Afrikanist. An Afrikanist is a black African who believes that Africa should be ruled by black Africans. That's an Afrikanist. An Afrikaner is a white person of Dutch, principally Dutch descent. Okay, keep that straight because it's going to come back in a few minutes. So the uh, Boer, you heard about the Boer War. Boer is a Dutch word for farmer, and the two words Afrikaner and Boer are synonymous. All right, so in um, apartheid uh, South Africa, and even before, there were three legal races that were distinctly treated differently in the legal code. They were the Afrikaans, different from an Afrik, I'm sorry, Afrikaners, that's a typo, it should, I'm off to a bad start here, Afrikaners, the blacks, and a word we don't use today, but is actively used in South Africa, the coloreds, who were people of mixed race, often include Chinese, sometimes included Indians, but the Indians were often a separate group. So the phrase coloreds has different meanings, but there eventually you'll see in the parliament were three different houses uh, for the Afrikaners, the Indians, and the coloreds. All right, so Fast forward 1806, you, you say the Dutch settled. How in the world did the British end up controlling? The short answer is that the British fleet invaded Cape Town and during the Napoleonic Wars conquered what was called the Cape Colony and turned it into a, a British colony. Um, and they won that relatively quickly and easily in 1806. So the British uh, set up in Cape Town and the Afrikaners didn't like it. And the main thing they didn't like about the English was that the English abolished slavery soon after this time. And slavery was a very important part of the uh, uh, Afrikaner economy. So they began what is called the Great Trek, which, if you go back to our map, goes from Cape Town. Oh, there we go. Northeast. They walked all this way up into what became known Orange Free Strait, and then this is actually Transvaal at the time. This would have been called the Transvaal. 
this is uh, Zululand down here, and so there were lots of fights and wars and battles, uh, which ended up kind of being a draw. So this area was settled by the Afrikaners, and this area became more English, British. Okay, so everything changed in 1871 when John, when uh, I think his name is Cecil John Rhodes of the Rhodes Scholarship in Rhodesia, uh, it was a he built De Beers because the Eureka Diamond, you've heard of, was discovered in the middle there of, of South Africa, and that changed everything because about a year and a half after that, they found gold, and at one point in the late 19th century. 95% of the diamonds in the world came from South Africa. So they first made it extremely valuable real estate, and then secondly, massive demand for labor, hard labor, down in the mines. And so that produced a huge influx of black Africans from other parts of South Africa. And these were dangerous jobs, but relative to other opportunities, they were reasonably good paying jobs. The Rothschild family, by the way, were the ones who financed uh, uh, Rhodes and others in developing De Beers. All right, so in uh, 1899 through 1902, we have the Boer Wars. And if you have ever read uh, young Churchill or you know anything about the early days of Winston Churchill, he actually was a reporter and covered the Boer Wars. He was captured in this war. This was a war between the English and the Afrikaners for control of South Africa. And uh, he was captured, spent time in a prison camp, and then escaped and went back to, um, to England and launched his political career. The other critical, important, famous person who was involved in this war was Gandhi. Gandhi was a stretcher bearer. Uh, he was obviously Indian and actually was very active in fighting for Indian rights, Indian meaning from India. And he um, uh, did a lot fighting for the rights of Indians in what is the Cape Colony. Now, I don't want to make the mistake of thinking that he was a leader fighting for black rights. He actually had some criticism, his, uh, looking back, that he said, look, they treat us as badly as if we were black. He was not exactly woke back then, um, but he was very successful in fighting for, uh, for Indian rights um, in the 1898 time frame. All right, so w the British win that war. They unite that whole area that we were looking at, and there is a formation of South Africa as a dominion of the uh, English Empire, of the British Empire. Very importantly, right after this is when the ANC, the African National Congress, is formed in 1912. In uh, 1934, uh, this becomes a sovereign nation, and in 1948, very important event, the African National Party, which is the party that really puts in place apartheid for the next uh, 50 years almost, uh, is formed and starts implementing the rules around apartheid. And apartheid is a word, a Dutch word that means separate. Uh, and these are all, the, the idea was we're going to separate the races. They're going to be different pe races, are going to live in different places. If you're going to be black and want to go to a white neighborhood, you have to have a passport. Uh, and so there were all these rules set up, and it really started in 1948. During World War II, uh, it was a big debate within South Africa about whether they would support the Allies. Uh, because of an animosity towards the English, there were a lot of Afrikaners who supported the Nazis. Parliament officially voted to be on the side of the Allies, but there was kind of a half-hearted support. And so, um, in fact, one of the future uh, presidents of South Africa was a pretty open Nazi. All right, so in 1913, we're going back in time a little bit, right after uh, the formation of the country, uh, you get the Natives Land Act. And you can think of this as sort of like America setting up reservations for the Native Americans. It's similar to what the uh, Afrikaners did for the tribes. They said, there, we're gonna set aside 13% of the country and, and black people are allowed to own, excuse me, uh, own land on that 13%. So the Zulus are allowed to be here. Uh, individual tribes have their own individual reservations. And surprise, surprise, this turned out to be lousy land, almost unfarmable, uh, and many, many people were pushed out of their homes. 
uh, and forced into the ghettos of Johannesburg. And so these lands were African, I, I always want to say African Americans, and that's obviously not right. Um, black people were not allowed to live in this whole white space. Now they could work there, but they couldn't own land in any of this white space. All right, now we get to our man Nelson Mandela. So he was not born Nelson Mandela, he was born Rahila Mandela, which means troublemaker. And he was born in, uh, in 1918. His mom sent him, uh, let me stop for a second. He was the son of a tribal chieftain. The Thimbu tribe had a lot of chieftains. His father had four wives, each of whom had three huts, one for cooking, one for sleeping, one for eating, thatch huts. So we are not talking as the son of a chieftain about you know, palatial uh, estates. Um, but he was the son of a chieftain, and that did end up being important in his life. His mother ended up sending him to a, a Methodist school where the, the missionary named him Nelson. Uh, he uh, was enrolled. His father died relatively early when he was nine years old, and he was raised by uh, the, the new head of the tribe and his mother, although he was really sent away very early at a very young age. He went to Fort Hill College, which was an all-black student but all-white teacher college. He was, got involved in student politics, uh, became a leader of the student government. There was a strike or a, a disagreement. And on a relatively minor, if you read his biography, Long Walk to Freedom, he talks about how there was some matter of principle that he wasn't willing to back down on. I think the principal wanted him to sign something saying uh, that I was wrong about X, and he wouldn't sign that, and so he was expelled. So uh, after this, he comes back to his tribe. His, the, the regent, the guy who's been raising him, gives him an arranged marriage. He goes and takes a look at his bride-to-be and decides that he's going to move to Johannesburg. <laughs> so uh, he and his cousin flee uh, the tribe and go to Johannesburg. And it's a fascinating story. He gets on this train with no passport. Uh, it's really a harrowing tale. But he does get to Johannesburg, and somehow, and it's, He's a little fuzzy on the details how this happened, but he got into the school and is, gets a law degree. Um, and uh, in his legal class, his law class, you see here, he's in the upper left. There's two other Indians, and then the rest of the class is white. But he actually becomes a member of the faculty of this school. So he is a real lawyer and forms a law firm. Uh, so this is a picture of Mandela as a young lawyer. He's, first of all, a very handsome man, very strong, tall, a great boxer, a great athlete, and, uh, but a refined lawyer, very knowledgeable about the legal system. And the, the this, um, story he tells is he's hired by this uh, black maid who's been accused by her uh, family, uh, or the mistress, the woman who had hired her, of stealing her clothes. And Mandela brings her into court and uh, holds up a pair of panties and says, ma'am, can you identify these as yours, uh, which you're saying your maid stole from you? And the woman says, I will not be treated in this way, and storms out of the courtroom. And the judge shakes his hand and says, case dismissed. So he was a, a very good lawyer who was uh, hired by uh, the black community to navigate the legal system, and he was a very good lawyer. There were not many black lawyers in Johannesburg at the time. All right, 1944, he joins the African National Congress, and he marries Evelyn Sisulu, who was the cousin of one of his very good friends. She was not political, and right away, uh, she was not happy with his spending as much time on politics as, uh, as he ended up. Uh, very importantly, the government passes the Suppression of Communism Act. And the reason this is so important is for the rest of apartheid, the apartheid governments will use the argument, I know you guys don't like, I know you America and Europe don't like our racial politics, but we are all that is between you and a communist Africa. And so they would make the case that their opponents in the ANC and Mandela himself were communists and that America and England, et cetera, needed to support uh, the nation of 
South Africa because of this fact. And this is where I'm going to jump forward and say people like myself and Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, who were not as supportive as, as in hindsight we should have been of the ANC and Mandela, this is kind of what we got wrong. We, in this time period, did view the world as a battle between communism and, and capitalism and um, felt that the ANC was on the wrong side of that battle. We'll talk about that as we go farther. All right. So in 1952, the ANC launches the Defiance Campaign. Uh, and at first, it's a peaceful campaign. Uh, it's strikes, it's work stoppages, it's, it's people not using the buses. Um, but as we'll see in a second, it, it starts to get more violent pretty quickly. In 1958, Mandela sees this woman named uh, Winnie at the bus stop. He offers her a ride in his fancy car. Uh, and he's still married to Evelyn, um, but pretty soon he's not. And he divorces Evelyn, and is, in his biography, it's pretty public that he had been unfaithful, if not regularly, uh, uh, when he was not the first person that he'd been unfaithful with. So he divorces Evelyn, and he marries Winnie Mandela. We're going to talk about Winnie in just a second in more detail. So that's a picture of them on their wedding day. That's Winnie on their wedding day. This is uh, Nelson on his wedding day back at his tribe, wearing his traditional uh, chieftain garb. Uh, and so he never left this behind. I guess we'll talk about this at dinner. I would argue that he, he did try to live in both worlds, but he spent a lot more time in the lawyer corporate world than he did in the, in the tribal world. This is their picture on the day that he's released. Uh, Winnie on the right, obviously. And uh, so now let's turn to Winnie Mandel. So she's a controversial person. And d people in this room are going to have different opinions about her. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, when you read Nelson Mandela's biography, he's not a particularly, he's not captain of the Winnie fan club by the time he writes his autobiography. But there are other people who think that he doesn't give her the credit that she deserves. So you can explore this at dinner. Um, they were married in 58. And after he goes to jail, which we're going to see in just a second, she is routinely harassed by the government. She's locked up uh, for certain periods of time herself. She becomes a, a real leader of the movement, keeping her name, his name in public eye, but also leading demonstrations, et cetera. Uh, she becomes the face in many places around the world of the apartheid struggle. Now, why is she controversial? A lot of reasons. She, although when he, I think when we think of Nelson Mandela, we think of uh, peaceful uh, resistance. We think of almost a Gandhi, Martin Luther King-like peacefulness, uh, rejection of violence. Uh, Winnie Mandela did not reject violence. She, there are a couple of quotes about her talking about how they have matches and necklaces to deal with the traitors. And if you know what a necklace is, that was where they would put a tire a rubber tire around someone's neck, pour gasoline on it, if they thought this person was a police um, spy, and then light the tire and watch the man burn in front of them. That's called a necklace. And there are all these horrible pictures of uh, them dealing with these spies. And she publicly came out in favor of necklaces. Um, the, her bodyguard group was called the Mandela United Football Club. And they were eventually convicted of cat kidnapping, murder. Uh, they were a very rough, rough group. Uh, in 1991, she herself was convicted of kidnapping Stumpy Saipai, uh, which I know I'm garbling. But he was 14 years old. There were actually four different um, kids who were kidnapped and murdered. She was convicted of having organized this kidnapping. Uh, after, so Mandela gets out of jail in 91, they separate in 92, and mostly he says it was her uh, acceptance of violence that he found unacceptable. She was a real a militant leader, and he was uh, arguing for peace and rejecting violence, and he says in his biography that he just couldn't accept that. Uh, again, in, after he was no longer president, she was convicted again of corruption in 2003. So she's controversial, but again, I don't want to bury the lead. There are people that would say it was Winnie that kept Mandela's name in front of the world, 
for 27 years and that she deserves a lot of the credit for the eventual successes. One of the questions you're gonna be dealing with at dinner was how was Nelson Mandela able to succeed? How were they able to bring down apartheid? And some of you may say Winnie deserves a lot of the credit. All right, 1958 is the formation of the Pan-African Congress. And this was formed by African Africanists who believed their saying was Africa for the Africans. They did not like the fact that the ANC was working openly with white groups, particularly the Communist Party, who were almost all white. So Mandela, if pressed, would say, we need allies. We uh, believe in democracy, one vote for every person, white and black. The Pan-African Congress said, nonsense. You guys are being dominated by these, these white communists. We are going to be an African-only group. So in 1960 is the Sharpeville Massacre. And I guess I personally compare this to the Boston Massacre uh, in our American Revolution. Uh, it was a group of people outside of a police um, station. There were hundreds of them pounding on the fence. One of the policemen thought he heard a gunshot, started shooting. The policeman shot uh, and killed 69 people and another 160 were wounded, uh, many of them with bullets in their back as they tried to flee. Uh, this was in Sharpeville, which is a suburb of Johannesburg, just outside of Johannesburg. It, this shocked the world uh, because it was uh, so obviously uh, the, the police really should not have felt as threatened as they did. Um, so at this point in 1961, the African National Congress forms Umkonto we Sizwe, which means spear of the nation. And it's, this is the military arm of the ANC. It's the first time where the ANC publicly uh, starts uh, military, violent, uh, non-peaceful uh, activities. And the initials in, in South African are MK, which is how it's referred to. Uh, up until then, again, uh, Mandela had been influenced by Gandhi and the nonviolent success that they had had in India. So this is the first time, and you have it in your readings, where he talks about why did they feel the need to start uh, violent protests, sabotage in particular. It was because, in the readings as you, as you uh, did before you got here, that they felt they'd been left no choice by the South African government. So there are three separate trials. The first one, Mandela, it, Mandela, sorry, Mandela goes underground and uh, becomes a, a driver. He has a false passport, which I'll show you in a second. He pretends to be a, a limousine driver. And uh, th he gets captured, and there are three trials. The first one he's convicted of, he's given five years for sabotage. The second one, he's actually found innocent. And then the third one is the Ravonia trial, which you have his testimony in your readings. And he, uh, people think he's going to get the death penalty. There are, I think, nine other defendants. They think they're all going to get the death penalty. The judge decides to not make them martyrs, and so he gives them life in, life in prison instead of the death penalty. Mandela spends 27 years in jail. He sees his wife on a handful of occasions. He goes years without seeing any member of his family. Uh, this, to me, is the, the shocking thing, that you could spend 27 years in prison, on a, most of it on Robben Island, and, and come away without a lot of apparent hatred, without uh, uh, a lot of, I mean, he clearly had animosity for his jailers, but um, not being permanently scarred. And we're going to talk a little bit more about life in jail and what that was like, but it is 27 years. This is his passport. Uh, the ANC has a museum dedicated to Mandela, and this is his false passport that he used as a driver. So it's hard, I think, to talk a lot about, um, about prison. I have different uh, impressions of this. People, I know a number of you have actually been here. Actually, show of hands, how many people have been to South Africa? Wow, that's very impressive. Uh, all right, so a lot of people have gone to Robben Island, um, and I'm influenced by what I know about Soviet history and books like Darkness at Noon, and I guess my impression is that this, the prisoners had some rights. 
They were able, when they were all forced to wear shorts, they were able to protest and write to the governor and eventually they were actually given slacks. Um, there w Mandela was able as a lawyer to say, you cannot uh, make us work seven days a week, 12 hours a day, we have these certain rights and those rights were not completely ignored. Now, his jailers were horribly racist, obviously, to him and insulted them all day long and made them work with hammers in the rock mines, literally the rock mines, where your job is to break rock to make gravel. Uh, but um, there are, he came out of this um, in a way that, let's just say, a lot, not a lot of Soviet dissidents came out of the Soviet gulag system. I don't want to in any way minimize this, but I think the British system of, of jurisprudence did in some ways survive the horrible apartheid system. All right, in 1976, there were the riots in Soweto, and these were mostly children, uh, mostly children, this was just outside of Sharpeville, almost the same place. There were massive riots, and, uh, and hundreds of kids died in these riots. Um, so Steve Biko, Biko uh, was killed in police custody. This became a, a world event. Uh, it's got a huge amount of attention. Um, he was, couldn't have been resisting arrest and he became almost as important as, as a martyr as Mandela was in 77. Uh, the release Mandela campaign started in London but then really spread around the world. This is a picture from Wembley Stadium on a free Mandela concert. They packed, I think, 100,000 people into this concert. Uh, so international boycott had started. The UN had already kicked South Africa out of the UN. There had been a prohibition on all sports. There had been real curtainment of trade. There had been an arms embargo. And it started to pressure the economy. So in 1984 is a first step to try to show they were willing to share power with the National Party set up a three-chamber parliament with the whites, coloreds, and Indians, noticeably no black representation. Um, this was their first attempt at liberalization. In 85, uh, the president uh, of South Africa offered Mandela and his co-cellmates freedom uh, if they would renounce violence, and they said no, they wouldn't, and so they stayed in jail for another six years. So. In 1990, February of 1990, uh, for the preceding about 12 months, Mandela had been brought out of jail for secret negotiations with the president of South Africa. And the main sticking point was uh, Mandela m insisted on one vote, one man. And I don't know whether they had women were, yeah, women were allowed to vote, excuse me, sorry. Um, and uh, and uh, Mandela insisted on non-racial no guarantee for white representation, and, and the national government said, if we give you this, you're gonna wipe us out, we'll have no representation quickly. Uh, Mandela promised that there would be a, uh, an alliance with the de Klerk himself represented. Uh, that was the sticking point in the negotiations for a long time. The, the white government wanted to have perpetual representation in the government, and finally, um, they agreed to trust Mandela. Uh, in 1992, a lot of people don't know this, there was a referendum, whites only, in which the white people of South Africa voted to end apartheid, and it passed, it's actually a typo, it was 68%, which does show that people by then realized the current system just couldn't survive. 93, Mandela and de Klerk both are awarded the joint Nobel Prize, and uh, there's a picture of the two of them, one of them looks happier than the other. Um, <laughs> and then in the general election in 94, uh, Mandela is elected president, the ANC uh, carries the election in an overwhelming landslide. There is what's called the tripartite, let me skip to this and I'll come back to that. Um, the tripartite uh, uh, alliance is the alliance between the ANC, which is Mandela, Joe Slovo, who was the head of the South African Communist Party and the head of the South African Trade Union Association. The three of them form an alliance and guarantee seats in the cabinet for all three of them. So, oh, we'll come back to that in a second. So, um, 
after elected, uh, Mandela forms the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and he puts Bishop, Archbishop Tutu in charge of that commission. And the idea is that this commission will have powers of, to explore the past and what's happened, also have the power to grant amnesty. And this was a critical part of the negotiations between Mandela and de Klerk. And uh, Bishop, Archbishop Tutu had such credibility with both sides that he was put in charge. And uh, the commission took hearings from both sides. Uh, the ANC was found to have murdered uh, its internal members. 23 individual members of the ANC were murdered for suspected um, being spies for the government. Uh, but obviously most of the horrible stories were about police brutality, brutality in, in prisons and the like, and they were truly horrible stories, most of whom were granted amnesty by uh, Archbishop Tutu. Um, so this is a famous event in, in uh, South African history. The Springboks were an all-white uh, rugby team who had dominated rugby and were not liked, not considered the South African team by African Americans. And you guys have probably seen, uh, there's a, a movie with Matt Damon and Morgan Freeman where they celebrate this event, which is uh, Mandela made the decision to come out and wear the ring, Springbok colors and, and accept and welcome showing unity between African American and white athletes. Uh, and this was a very important point in history of uh, trying to unify the country. So. This is, a, again, a little bit of, of my apology for why we Republicans were on the wrong side of this topic, and we clearly were. Um, and that is that, that Mandela uh, sort of, if he was trying to say that he wasn't a communist, he didn't do a very good job of it. And so let me just read you his testimony in, uh, in his trial. He was asked if he was a communist, and here's what he said. If by communist you mean a member of the Communist Party and a person who believes in the theory of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin, and who adheres strictly to the discipline of the party, I am not a communist. <laughs> if that's not a non-denial denial, I don't know what is. So, uh, and, and you saw in your readings that on his first day out of, of prison, he thanks the communist leadership uh, for their support throughout the years. In his book, Long Walk to Freedom, he says, people say that the communists took advantage of us. I say that we took advantage of the communists. So his point was that when you're in a situation like this, you need allies. The, uh, the communists were offering guns and, and help and, and support, uh, and he needed that support. And what actually makes this situation work out for Mandel in the end is, with wonderful timing, the Soviet Union collapsed almost on the day he was let out of prison, and so this became a lot less of a hot button issue. Uh, pretty quickly, the South, the ANC renounces the communism, and uh, even though Mandela's successor was a member of the Communist Party as well, uh, you can say that they sort of got lucky in terms of timing. I just want to spend a, a brief minute on this, and some of you are going to talk about this a lot and over dinner, some of you aren't. But things since Mandela died have been choppy in South Africa. And you, you saw this in your reading. This came from uh, two days ago in the New York Times. There have been riots with South Africans attacking Nigerian businesses. Uh, and the Nigerian government has been airlifting out Nigerian uh, residents of South Africa. The economy is not in good shape. Um, probably a lot of you remember that Mandela's successor uh, said that he didn't believe that HIV and AIDS were related, and so he denied drugs to a lot of the hospitals, and so millions of people died in South Africa from AIDS. So this, it's been a choppy uh, period after, the, after Mandela died, and so understanding whether any of that is Mandela's fault or not, um, we can talk about it. I don't happen to personally think it was, but I, you could argue that the people who followed him were not up to his caliber would be one possible point.